This is the fourth of four videos on aesthetic crown lengthening, and this one deals with complex crown lengthening. Complex crown lengthening means that we remove facial gingiva, buccal bone, as well as interdental bone. And the case that we're going to show in a moment is based on Coase's concept of occlusal therapy, which I have slightly modified. First, he has acceptable function. The case we're going to show is an anterior constriction dysfunction, occlusal dysfunction, and parafunctional dysfunction, as well as neurological dysfunction. The latter three will be discussed later on a video which will be added. Anterior constriction. We see we have a very deep overbite here. And in an anterior constriction, these are our clinical findings. First, we have an excessive overbite, which you noted on that. Number two, we have extensive wear on the facial and the mandibular incisors, as well as excessive wear on the palatal and the maxillary anteriors. There's no wear on the posterior areas because the patient chews like a rodent, not like a cow. And because of this, without the lateral excursions, the patient has no uh, temporal mandibular symptoms. Now, on the left, we see the pre-op view, and then on the right, we see the severe wear on the facial, the lower anteriors, which is a classic finding in the anterior dysfunction. Let's look at some dimensions here. First of all, the canines and the central incisors should be at the same level as we pointed out before. Interestingly enough, both the canine and the central incisors are 11 millimeters long. And later you will see that these crowns should have been at least three millimeters shorter, but we will discuss that in a minute. Here we see a pre-op on the left of the severe wear on these lower anterior teeth. And I think you can realize if these teeth are crowned, we're gonna have to do some crown lengthening. Again, note the wear, which is symbolic of what we see in an anterior constriction dysfunction. We see the probe in place on the right, and if we look here, we see that five millimeters from the contact point, the bone should be, and we have very little tooth structure, especially in the interdental area to place a crown. And then on the right, after you have seen where we've removed about two millimeters of bone in the interproximal area, we now have the contact point is gonna be there, and we have enough tooth to crown. Now, let's look at the maxillary arch and we see the pencil mark that I placed on that. That, those crowns are three millimeters too long. And that means that if we go 11 millimeters, then we look and see where the teeth have been shortened and they crown lengthening needs to be done about three millimeters on these maxillary anterior teeth. So here is the pre-op view on the left. This is uh, initial healing on the mandibular arch, and you can see where we have shortened those central incisors about three millimeters. Now they're eight millimeters long, and they need to be uh, crown lengthened to 11 millimeters long, which is going to bring the plane from the canine to the canine in the area of the gingival margin of the central incisors where it should be. Like I say, this is eight millimeters long, and we want to lengthen them longer. So this is after we've done crown lengthening, initial healing on that, and the patient is now ready to go to the restorative dentist to crown those lower anteriors. And this is what it looks like. And you will note the contact point where it is, and the contact point would be three millimeters higher had we not done the crown lengthening. And as pointed out earlier, notice that the papilla has regenerated five millimeters incisally just as Tarno told us that would do. This is a six months post-op and the patient is now ready for the maxillary surgery. Why did we wait six months? Well, the main reason is the lower surgery was done in one insurance year and the patient wanted to get a maximum benefit so delayed the maxillary surgery until the next year. Now, here we have the six months post-op after we have shortened the teeth, 
and you can compare that with the one on the left and we can see how much we have shortened that. So now we do not have the deep overbite, overbite which was contributory to the anterior constriction dysfunction. On this surgery slide, you will note that the osseous surgery has been completed on tooth number nine. You notice the architecture with it higher on the distofacial. We see the three millimeters of biologic width. We will now repeat the same thing on number eight on the left. And you can also see that we need to raise the contact point and we will remove two millimeters of bone in the interdental area. So from the incisal edge to the crest of the bone should be 14 millimeters on a central incisor and the bone should be slightly higher on the distal facial line angle than on the mesial. This is the caliper that we use that we mentioned earlier. Remember on the left, the crown lengthening had not been done, but after that was done, we see the suturing present on the right and you will notice a slight char mark on number nine where we accentuated the uh, gingival height on the distal but failed to do that on number eight. And that will be a slight aesthetic compromise. This is one of my more effective images and you will see those premolars which are supposed to be nine millimeters long, how much bone we're going to have to remove on the facial if we're going to get that nine millimeter length. And actually at surgery, you see where I put these pencil marks on there, which is going to be the margin of the crown ultimately. And you can see after doing the crown lengthening that we have three millimeters biologic width, apical to where the margin of the crown is going to be. Here it is the day we sutured. And now about three or four weeks later, you can see where the tissue margin heal and we have exactly the margin that we want. And here we see a 13 year post-op of the beautiful restorative that was done by a general dentist in West Memphis, Arkansas, Dr. Chuck Woods. Now remember, this is where we want our gingival margin. This is after we have done uh, the lower surgery and placed the crowns. And now we see the 13 year post-op where the length of those teeth now are all 11 millimeters long. The laterals are nine millimeters long. And look at what a wonderful service that we have done the patient. And there will be no wear on the posterior teeth because remember, this patient chews like a, uh, a rodent and doesn't wear laterally. So we did not alter the vertical dimension at all on this case. So the restorative, as I said earlier, is the compliments of Dr. Chuck Woods of West Memphis, Arkansas. The importance of proper diagnosis and the interpupillary line. This is a case that I initially misdiagnosed until the patient corrected me on that. As we look here, notice how the patient postures the lip. Why is she doing that? Well, there's recession on that canine. And I said, well, Joy, what we need to have done is a coronal position flap to cover that reception on the canine. And she looked at me quizzically and then pointed to the lateral incisor. She says, well, that recession doesn't bother me, but this little tooth right here bothers me. So what we did, we drew the interpupillary line, which is parallel to the gingival margin of the teeth and lo and behold, she's exactly right. She needs to have crown lengthening done slightly on number nine, but significantly on number 10. So I misdiagnosed that, but we were able to correct it and we'll see how it was treated. This is a very innovative case where I learned a lot and I would like to share that with you. The patient Joy is a widow and she is marrying a fellow dentist who is also a widower. And I first saw her in the middle of May and after diagnosing her, she informed me that she not only wanted to have this done, but she wanted to have her crowns in place when she went on her honeymoon on July the 4th. Obviously, you can see the challenge and pressure that that put on me. 
The first thing I did is meet with Dr. Reddick, the restorative dentist that her husband had recommended, and we planned the case. On the left, you will see where there is a stent in place. Dr. Reddick took an impression, did a wax up, made a model out of that, and then did a suck down stent so that I could see the incisal edge to measure from because she was going to see him the first thing in the morning about 7.30, prep the teeth, and begin making a temporary where she would come to my office about 8.30 or 9 o'clock and I would do the crown lengthening. And if I did not have this stent in place, I did not have anywhere to measure from to see exactly where to make my bleeding points. On the right, you see the area flapped with a pencil mark showing the margin of the crown that Dr. Reddick had previously uh, prepared. We're going to go in there, as on the other case, move, remove about two millimeters of interdental bone so the contact point will move apically and we will create a biologic width of three millimeters so the crest of the bone will be 14 millimeters on the central incisor from the incisal edge. This is where we're pointing out, we see where the papilla it would be if we didn't do the crown lengthening. And after doing the crown lengthening, you can see the margins of the restoration, of the preparations rather, are exposed. At this point, the patient will go back to Dr. Reddick and he will refine the preparation, taking the margin right down to the crest of the gingiva, not below it. Because remember, we're gonna get a little rebound on that, which will cover the margins of the crown. When the patient came back with a temporary in place, it was about 4.30 in the afternoon. Remember the patient had been seen since 7.30 that morning. She was tired and I was tired and I was sick when I saw this. Because what Dr. Riddick had done on this, on this temporary, he had completely obliterated the embrasure space and the contact point did not allow for any regeneration of the papilla. So I had to take a diamond disc and open all of these embrasures up. And at that point, I was so exhausted that I forgot to take a final picture. But you will be able to see on the post-op how those embrasure spaces were opened up. And now we see her three weeks later. We can see the sutures present. Uh, these were vicral sutures, so they were non-resorbable. And you can see the difference in the shape of the temporaries where I had opened them up three weeks before. At this point, we removed the sutures, sent the patient to Dr. Reddick to seat the final crowns. So the embrasure space allowed for regeneration of the papilla. Now, about three weeks post-op, uh, or maybe a little longer, I think this is right after she came back from the honeymoon, you can see the embrasure spaces are not completely filled with the papilla. But if we wait at a six months recall, Look how that papilla has come down because we have created exactly the embrasure space to get uh, periodontal help. So here is the pre-op view and here is a six month post-op view and then a full arch support. Notice the, the uneven uh, clusal plane, certainly not matching the inner uh, pupillary distance. And then we can see the, uh, the final result. Openly where she had the spaces on the lower, veneers were placed down there, and it was a very successful case. I'd like to thank Dr. John Riddick from Memphis, who was my co-therapist on this case, and I think you will agree that this was a very innovative approach, which we were able to do because we understood uh, rebound of tissue, we understood embrasure spaces and all those. So if you're a skillful periodontist and you've got a skillful restorative dentist, this is something that you can do. Here's another case using the same protocol. Not only did she have uh, a gummy smile, but she had severe staining from tetracycline. So we did the crown lengthening, had the final impression made the first day, and now we see the three-week post-op. So this is something that I would suggest that the skillful periodontist and the excellent restorative dentist may consider as a treatment option. 
Now, let's talk about crown lengthening to uh, enhance restorative and focus again on the biotype. Here we see the length of the tooth that we need to crown lengthen. And where with the caliper, this is where we're going to make a bleeding point. And you will notice that this is a millimeter higher on number eight than it is on number nine. So this is after the crown lengthening was done. And again, you will note on this that we have crown lengthened to 12 millimeters because we have severed the epithelial attachment and we're going to get some level of rebound. And you will see that this is a normal biotype. And a three weeks later, we see the tissue has rebounded about a millimeter and the tooth is the proper length that it should be. And I'd like to focus on the fact that this was a normal biotype. But what if it was a thick biotype? We'll discuss that in a minute. Crown lengthening to enhance orthodontics. Obviously, on the left, with that tremendous gingival overgrowth, there was no way that any brackets could be placed for orthodontic treatment. So basically, we did crown lengthening on the right, which basically was compound crown lengthening, not complex. One of my favorite cases, this lady came in, she was a sorority sister of my daughters at Ole Miss, and where she presented this case, she said, I don't like my smile, but don't mention orthodontics to me because I'm not going to have orthodontics done. Now, given that, how can you help me? Well, obviously what she needs is orthodontic treatment because we can see how prominent tooth number seven is. In any event, you can see how much crown lengthening we were going to have to do very significantly because these central incisors were positioned somewhat lingually. So this is after we, uh, the pre-op on the right, and look at the initial healing that took place uh, following the crown lengthening basically on the central incisors. And note the difference in the appearance of tooth number seven. So we allowed that to heal. This is the pre-op view, and this is the post-op view following the crown lengthening. At this point, she could have uh, some disking done on the mesial and the distal of number seven, and with a removal of appliance, that tooth could be positioned and finalize the aesthetics on this particular case. Now, combined treatment, crown lengthening and root coverage grafting. Here we see uh, what a central that needs to be crown lengthened. And when we crown lengthen that, notice that we have a thick biotype. Now, what does that tell us? That tells us that we're going to get more rebound than when we have a normal biotype. And if we have a thin biotype, then we're going to get very little rebound. So, as just on the case we showed you a few moments ago, we're going to crown lengthen 12 millimeters, allowing one millimeter of rebound to match up with tooth number nine. Here we see in place, and we can see the biologic width, and we can see where the crown margin should be, and you will notice that this is a good 12 millimeters, perhaps even a little bit more on a thick biotype. But I mentioned that this is a combined case where we also did root coverage grafting with a connective tissue graft on the canine. And this points out that what I refer to as the periodontist is a seamstress and the gingival margin is like the hem of the dress. We can raise the hem of the dress by doing aesthetic crown lengthening or we can lower the hem of the dress by doing some type of root coverage grafting. So, I think there's a good reason for calling the periodontist a seamstress. We can see on the left where we've done aesthetic crown lengthening on the central and where we've done the connective tissue graft on the canine. This is where we started. Remember, this is a thick biotype. That's a little over 12 millimeters, but look how thick the tissue is. This is the day it was sutured, and this is the way it healed up. And if we look at that, we've got the free gingival groove and the length of that tooth is now about 10 and a half millimeters. It needs to be 11. And very simply, we could go in there and do simple crown lengthening with a radio surgery unit and get the dimension that we wanted. 
but it's often difficult to convince the patient to have a minor second surgery done, even though it would improve the aesthetics. And on the canine, we can see initial healing on that. You can see the red dots there where the sutures are healing. So this is about a three week post-op. We quoted this earlier by Dr. Hornbrook. Behind every general practitioner who excels in cosmetic and aesthetic dentistry, there is usually a gifted periodontist who shares similar passion for achieving symmetry and artistry. So in closing on this fourth of the series of videos, we see the combination of what we can do with excellent periodontal therapy and the final aesthetic result. So the first video is on the benefits. The second is on simple crown lengthening. The third is on compound crown lengthening. And the fourth, this one is on complex crown lengthening. Use and enjoy.